Hello everyone, today we talk about the Vandalic sack of Rome, 455 uh, AD. For the record, this is the first video of yet another new series about the city of Rome. Specifically, I will blend it in with the uh, the ones of, about Roman history uh, in general, but it's dedicated specifically to the city and this is therefore for a created I have already created, as, as a matter of fact, a playlist for you know those who are who are specifically interested in the topic, uh, and it will cover, as a matter of fact, uh, all Roman history to this day, right to the third millennium. Uh, and uh, some of you asked me. I've had a couple of followers. Um, one asked me, you know, about you know more about especially medieval Rome. Um, and I added that modern contemporary Rome is actually quite fascinating in a way. Um, and I'll explain what I'm doing this, by the way. And uh, another one who, who was particularly interested in instead the, the decadence of Rome during the early Middle Ages, which we will in part uh, address, um, of course, to, if we go on with the series, which is awfully long considering the amount of things that there are to say, uh, and maybe has something to do with also the siege of 455s we will see um, and so I'm sure that for uh, for these followers there of course are very uh, dearly um, uh, welcoming their requests um, but for any other who is uh, interested specifically in the history of Rome just know that I created this 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 other thing more in detail um, and I will not digress on the reasons why I do this uh, as I was saying before I may make I mean, another video entirely to to discuss it, but today we will talk just about the Vandalic siege. Uh, actually, the, the Vandalic mm, sack, because that's that what what it was concretely. There wasn't much of a you know a resistance in that sense, as we will see. So you know what the the background here is, right? Is that the, the death of Attila that had uh, attempted already. I uh, actually carried out the the invasion of Italy, uh, pushing as you know as far as the Po River, and where he had been allegedly stopped by the uh, you know the, the legion goes by, by the Pope himself. Actually, there, there were actually only two um, emissaries of the Pope that, however, negotiated the retreat. Also, because there was a a plague that had broken out in the Hunnic army, the uh, the Eastern Romans were threatening the Hunnic um, uh, logistical uh, lines, um, with the connection with the you know the the Pannonian, uh, the Pannonian uh, center of power of the Huns, and uh, eventually Attila died the year after. But he would have come back, right? And the point being that here the the peninsula had remained fundamentally uncovered as. Um, after the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, uh, the the Aetius alliance uh, of you know this Romano-Germanic coalition that managed to to stop um, the the Hunnic uh, invasion of, of of the West was or um, broke broke down right in Italy. Uh, Aetius couldn't count on the Visigoths, for example, and and thus the peninsula appeared. Um, defenseless by a certain degree, and as we will see now, Aetius was taken out, and uh, the same Valentinian the third, who had him killed, uh, was killed um, in a in a palace conspiracy, and the in the same Rome. And and therefore the Vandals took advantage of the situation and said, you know, this is the right moment to strike. You know, the Vandals had established this African kingdom which uh, was was very maritime oriented because Africa was very developed Roman Africa was quite developed and uh, the Vandals weren't at all the you know the, the at least particularly oppressive rulers considering time standards uh, that in fact the same term Vandalic vandalism will, you know remain right mostly because of Papal Byzantine um, uh, propaganda, which is perfectly fine, right? The the popes had a beautiful, dramatically intelligent and and developed propaganda that, you know, was used at the time by everybody. And, that, and it's funny when people, however, still believe this in the in the third millennium, like chapeau to the popes, um, and not much to you know how people can 
uh, how dumb they, they can be in the first place. Um, the, re the main reason being that the, the Vandals had occupied Sicily in this situation. Sicily was an area where the Roman Church had historically had uh, owned an enormous amount of wealth, a lot of estates and so on. So um, they always tried to, to, to recover it in a way or another as the, the Pope uh, at the vanishing of the Western Imperial uh, Roman power was naturally kind of o overlapping to the same kind of um, um, filling the gap and especially later on with, when the, the West was formally you know uh, abolished the, uh, the, the the main goal was always to remain this the centralized power in the in the far or at least you know in, in the West of from frontier let's say extremity of the Empire and um, profiting from from that position but um, the Pope didn't quite have uh, an army on its own, and the, the, the old, at, at that time, actually, Italy itself had the potential for levying an army as, and even reconquering chunks of the empire's, you know, Majorianus expedition in Spain proved, if the Vandals properly hadn't gotten in the way, um, uh, and especially if there hadn't been such a great leader as Geyseric that managed to properly even you know, withstand um, politically, even before the military, the Eastern Roman naval invasion of of Africa that, as you know, was was essentially that failed at Cape Bon. Um, we would have easily had a, a Western Roman Empire still by the time of the Islamic invasions um, in the West, or maybe the Islamic invasions would have neither happened for some reason at that point. In the balance of power. Um, but at this point, however, the uh, you know there was still a problem of recruiting an army, keeping it together. So it was not a automatic. And and at this point, Italy was uncovered. And or at least you know there was uh, an important you know permeability of, of the same. And so what what better target for for a kingdom like the one of the Vandals that controlled in fact Sicily, Sardinia. I don't remember whether the Balearic Islands already. Uh, but yes, that had this mainly piratic interest, right? And that was what uh, eventually the Saracens would do from the same place. Um, what historically, even, I don't know, the Carthaginians before had been in this maritime potential, that as long as, especially Italy, that was, you know, fat um, and, and rich and but somewhat politically weak, was, you know, represented the best, um, the best um, target uh, for. And that, in fact, would be quite a problem when it restrengthened dramatically under the Ostrogoths who made it, uh, made of it in the world west and the world Mediterranean, kind of a, a new superpower. As a matter of fact, an axis also with the Visigoths and with some Central European peoples that were opposed to the to the uh, to the Catholic axis formed by the Franks and and the, and the Byzantines. When, ironically enough, the Vandals, who were Aryans, just like the Ostrogoths, <laughs> it preferred to ally with, with the Catholics, who incidentally would actually start with Belisarius invading them first in order to conquer Ostrogothic Italy. So that tells you how, after all, you know, limited um, the options of the Vandalic kingdom at some point really were. And really, Geyseric made it. Uh, without Geyseric stands out, like it was one of the greatest Romano-Germanic uh, Chieftains, then I don't think we need to go back in the, the history of the Vandalic people and how they had gotten there. I made a video, it's a quite old, but people keep watching it for some reason. Uh, and, you know, there were these uh, interesting uh, Germanic, Slavic, Celtic, um, and who knows what melange that more or less from today's areas of Poland um, had gone through this, you know, this very interesting right right across uh, central uh, Europe and then eventually in Gaul in Spain where they made a mess and finally establishing this kingdom in Africa and instead was quite stable right and quite uh, even we talk about the Vandalic Renaissance at some point in the local art etc that of course were preserved by you know the, the Roman society in Vandal Africa was preserved like in all these Roman and Germanic kingdoms as, as a matter of fact and there is not even a single proof of any, for example, archaeologically of any destruction of Catholic churches would have been pretty dumb to do because at that point we would have just had to wait that that bishop died, uh, and you would have put uh, an Arian one in there in, in his stead, right? So, 
Um, in any case, uh, it was also a florid era for that matter uh, on its own. The general international situation was not particularly florid, right? We are at, you know, some still, you know, the, the late antiquity had consistently contracted, but still up to the mid 6th century, right? It was another good century of before the, the Justinian uh, plague that made, uh, especially the Mediterranean, still particularly, you know, well, well off in, in some way. Um, so the, um, the, the there was some some aspects that uh, replicated, like uh, for example the meeting of uh, Pope Leo the Great with Geyseric, which actually happened in person at this point, as not the, the one with Attila hadn't quite taken place as far as we understand. So, um, as we were saying before, Valentinian the third, after the intervention of Leo the first or over. Attila had resumed to rule, uh, also supported by the, you know, valiant behavior of the general Etius, that um, perhaps with his firm military attitude had also mm, contributed to determine the retreat of the Huns, because still when they had invaded Italy, they, um, yes, Aquileia had been sacked, but, you know, story goes that just because, you know, the Huns that were as most steppe peoples, not particularly versed in, in siege warfare, because, you know, just one one wall of the city had crumbled on its own. This picture of decadence, who knows how the thing went. I'm sure, it probably didn't go like that. Um, but the Romans were carrying out a quite nasty guerrilla warfare against the Huns, and um, there was, as we've seen, also the Eastern uh, Roman um, uh, support, and so probably Etius had kept working like like this. It's just he didn't have enough manpower in Italy at that point to like in goal um years before to you know to stop to stop the, the, the hunt or at least to face them in, in open field like had been uh, the case on the Catalonian plains. Uh, however exactly on the attitude of the the proud uh, Roman general um in, arose um soon, quite soon, doubts, uh, you know, voices, uh, contestations. Um, and the year after the defeat of the Huns in 454, um, a palace conspiracy uh, actually, you know, uh, carried out by the same Valentinian III led to the death of Etsis, as you know, who was who accepted his death as a, as a true soldier. He understood there was no way out. He was beheaded on the spot when he was found. A soldier's death. Now, on May the 16th, 455, in Rome, where, um, you know, Valentinian found himself in his uh, suntuous residence, uh, Ad Duas Lauros, uh, which is um, located the third mile of the Via Labicana, and not in the uh, mm, uh, field of Mars, as some, you know, other historians said, uh, fell victim of a of a consp of a plot himself. Uh, he was assassinated. And the 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 historian Prosperus of 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 Tyre, in order to to demonstrate kind of the you know the payback, the karma coming back at the Augustus um, that had been responsible of that of Atius, um at least made this joke saying that at least the way Valentinian was killed hadn't required even, you know, a sword to be unseated. Um, so, and think, we don't know how things actually went. But in any case, at this point, um, the uh, usurper Maximus rose to the throne, right? At the point in which the, the city was quite, mm, you know, prostrated and kind of disoriented uh, without uh, a sound defense. And this is the moment in which uh, the feral news arrived about the landing of Geyseric and of his vandals on the shores of the Tiber River. Um, the vandals coming from Africa and Sicily. So Rome at this point uh, was, um, 
you know, devoid of adequate military defense, right? They, the population consequently uh, freaked out um, at the moment in which the, 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 the sails of the Vandalic ships were seen at, uh, at Ostia. And the tumultuous citizenry of Rome, in order to to take uh, revenge of essentially the, the incapacity of Maximus, who doesn't show to have doesn't prove to have any a, any mean to ensure the incolumity of the former imperial capital, because by the way, Rome was always the capital of the Roman Empire. There's never been a moment historically in which Rome was not a capital. It's just that the administrative one, it, 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 administratively speaking, it had been uh, Ravenna at, at this point. Um, but in this sense, the Romans felt like, what the hell, man? You know, we, we are the, the sacred holy city, the, the, the capital of the empire. You know, the, nobody defends us anymore. So this was seen as proof of the decadence of the situation or and all. So th the populace killed Maximus, stoning him to death without mercy after less than 80 days of reign. So the news of the palace conspiracy and its you know, unfortunate conclusion seems to have actually speeded up uh, the Vandalic um, action uh, as Geyseric moved from from Ostia towards Rome. Um, and to stop um, the, the advance were the negotiations with the Pope, uh, who uh, tried to renew the prodigy that uh, had previously preserved Rome from the Hunnic invasion. And however, if, you know, that first time the papal intervention as we know, had been re, um, had resolved the 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 matter e uh, easily, uh, or at least happily. In this second stance, the miracle uh, was not renewed, or at least you know not completely. Given that the negotiations had, however, some effect to mitigate the vandalic action, because Leo appeared, of course, in this. You know, you have to think of a world where people were extremely um, wary of any spiritual power and force. The the Vandals were Christians. It doesn't matter that they were Aryans and that many of them presumably still pagan in some form. The papal presence, right, the one of, of the eternal city, ruler of the world, is not something that you say, oh, well, whatever, you know, you have to be extremely careful about for anything that you do. So, Leo had presented himself with his great, with a sacred paraphernalia, bringing the, the cross, right, and so he met with the barbarian, exhorting him not to offend the city where the apostles, Peter and Paul, have been martyrized. And Geyseric, however, is only partially struck by the majesty of the uh, the Pope he will promise him not to uh, uh, burn or kill in Rome right um, and however he will uh, commit himself only to spare from loot the three historical Basilicas of Saint Peter, Saint Paul, and Saint John Lateran. The, the, of course, the the magic triad, the most important churches in in the history of Christendom. And for the rest, as greatest concession, Geyseric will allow um, his troops only a relatively brief sack. Right. The the result was not optimal but n not even entirely negative. Uh, the Vandals were not probably all that safe in this situation because still there could be some, you know, force that could intervene to to protect Rome or at least, you know, to, to put 
some strains to to the vandal uh, you know operations and, and so on so they were just there for methodically to loot it's been uh, as it had been with alaric that sacked in also in a much less contained way right um and after all um we also must consider that uh, geyseric uh, at that point could have not really stopped his own people in the first place because they were all uh aiming at that uh conclusion of an enterprise that as it had been implicit in, in the expedition itself would have bro brought them uh, enormous riches given that every soldier as it's uh, known remains in part owner of the loot that he manages to collect in the assaulted city naturally you can imagine during the negotiations that the so everything that could be saved and that can be transported in time would be stored in areas such as the aforementioned basilicas that you know, would, have, would have not been touched and so on. Um, a reason for which, um, even if Geyseric had wanted to, you know, to 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 come to to a better uh, agreement for for Leo the Great, he would have probably not have had the even the the capacity there to stop completely his troops uh, and preventing uh, at least a, a, a quick sack, uh, a rapid sack. In reality, eventually things will not even, in fact, um, uh, unfold exactly accordingly to the agreement. In fact, three days after the death of Maximus, the Vandals entered Rome from the Via Portuensis giving place to a devastation that was not at all you know uh, contained and, and, and short like as the uh, the one of Alaric but that lasted instead for two uninterrupted weeks and different and more serious will thus be uh, the the fate of of Rome compared to the one of 45 years before. Um, in fact, the Vandals mm, had, even even if roughly programmed, right, how to sack systematically the various quarters with method, right? Um, and this naturally brought to mostly the, the gold, the, the, the silver, jewels, precious stones, sculptures of the single uh, regiones in which Rome was subdivided um, to be concentrated um, the um, you know part of the riches according to the custom is left in the hands of the troops that have come properly with the sovereign of uh, from the lands of Roman Africa and the majority of the loot will however be uh, loaded uh, will be piled up on huge wagons that uh, had been uh, stationed uh, close to the uh, tree fountains area that is in the essentially in the area of today's St. Paul uh, and thus uh, sent along the Portuensis road uh, up to the mm, uh, portal infrastructures on the Tiber where it would have been loaded on Geyseric's ships that would quite, uh, you know, uh, speedily uh, sailing, would have sailing uh, south. This is interesting because, of course, Geyseric took his own larger part of, of the loot, which m with much better transportation, etc. And said the, the average vandal warrior would have had literally to have his own sack filled with stuff, you know, and going on foot uh, back to to the ships and uh, and yeah well that this was normal by the way and and of course it was as you understand here an important organization of the looting um, method so in in those days uh, you know it's hard to talk about this because if you think about how much is lost of what Rome had historically 
I mean, not just on this occasion, but this is one of the worst ones, of course. Um, you know, you really want to to cry for the rest of your life, basically. Uh, mostly because this stuff went lost, as we will see now, in a, when, uh, in a way or in another, right? So, uh, during the Vandalic sack, the Imperial Palace, which had been, by the way, newly furnished after the damage that had, in part, compromised it, uh, after the devastation of 410. And also the public buildings located along the Via Sacra suffered the same uh, fate. Um, so these were some of the most important monuments in Rome. And uh, these uh, Suntos villas uh, located on the foothills of the Esquiline and the Quirinal Hills uh, were uh, the the Horti Salustiani, uh, that uh, where where the the Visigoths had broken through, and it part of the only area that they had devastated at that point, uh, were again uh, suffering the rapacity of the invader. Um, this time, also in the same way, uh, of the buildings of the uh, Flaminian and the Trans Tiber areas, and. Um, Th this is interesting, as said, in, 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 as we were saying before, that from the Capitoline Hill, um, sacred and precious objects were were taken. Uh, some of these objects were actually some of the most important in the history of Rome, uh, so much that the, the Christians had preserved them even after the Theodosian Edict, that had recognized, you know, the 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 official uh, Christianity of the empire, and thus also essentially put down the the older uh, public cults at least. Um, and in fact, the same imperial authority had protected these uh, riches from the eventual Christian attacks with care and respect uh, in the temple of Jupiter. Um, the statues of which will end up in Africa to embellish the palace of Geyseric. Now, on, on the same occasion, this is, this is said by Procopius of Caesarea, by the way, later on, um, uh, a good part of the same uh, roof of the temple uh, will be uh, dismantled, from which properly the uh, bronze slabs uh, that m made the the, the the roof shine, uh, the rooftop shine, from, you know, uh, from from a very far distance, were taken away. Now the history of these precious objects um, and their uh, actually their same origin and their uh, following uh, movements, right, is is very interesting and fil filled with meaningful references because. Among the various objects that were preserved in the imperial palaces and in the Capitoline temples uh, that had been brought to Rome by the Emperor Titus that had subtracted them from Jerusalem and the province of Palestine to bring them with him as the Victory War Trophy. And Still, Procopius says that the same object, so we're talking about golden uh, candelabras, uh, bronze tripods, uh, silver vessels, some um, um, copper perfume burners, um, will go essentially to Carthage after the Vandalic sack. Um, and uh, so, taken as a new prey of war by Geyseric, that they will have. Uh, them located in his royal residence and uh, also in the ones of the you know the the, the, the rest of the Vandalic nobility and as you know uh, Carthage 80 years later in 535 was uh, reconquered by Belisarius the most famous general of the Emperor Justinian who will uh, actually bring this loot, including the, the, the same masterpiece, is, um, into Constantinople, in the Blackerna Palace. 
And at that point, so all these stuff that had been looted, the sign of the Jewish wars, and the Byzantine Jews at the time, Procopius concludes with the a anecdote, uh, would recognize, of course, those works of art, and they would remain speechless, right? So that Justinian at that point, you know, Justinian actually, reper you know, was quite, you know, religiously um, uh, repressive, but strict in the same sense. So he he was trying to accomplish the the the, the, uh, the ecumenic dimension of the empire it had to to act perfectly in the face of god so he was shaken by a sort of mystic terror for the impiety of this sacred uh, theft essentially because at the time by the way the romans were pagans right i mean at the time of titus and so having stolen these goods from the jews in a time you know from the perspective of, of, of Justinian, and to still consider, of course, the Old Testament um, uh, a sacred scripture, uh, would bring the emperor, in fact, to command that all these treasures that had thus uh, reached Constantinople would come back to the Holy Land, where, f from the first time, they had been uh, taken away. Naturally, located in Christian churches, not not in in Jewish uh, Jewish um, synagogues, in, in, but the um, the Jewish riches in this sense would take the um, the way of Israel, and, and they will uh, end up there. After that point, as you understand, in Islamic hands after the the Muslim conquests, and finally, even uh, properly after the Crusades, they would find. Uh, place in fact in, in the various Christian churches of Jerusalem uh, stably let's say now this is interesting because we actually don't know anything about these treasures like we don't have them so this is just a legion right who did take them uh, because they were in Rome as a matter of fact at the time uh, we we don't have at least this anecdote about the about Alaric's sack. Um, they uh, so where did they go? Were they taken away by yes the the vandals and then you know yes some were maybe lost in Africa or some were yes recuperated by the Byzantines but you know where did they go? Right? Did they actually come back to the Holy Land? Were they taken from by the Arabs by the Crusaders? Right. Think about the treasure, the Templars. Think about, you know, the, you know, we don't know, right? The mystery surrounds all this thing, unfortunately, and we we can't even properly say whether this odyssey of of these um, sacred objects actually is even historical reality, per se. Certain is that by the time of the Vandal sack, Rome owned some of you know, the most mind-blowing stuff that you can imagine, and then, unfortunately, this thing went lost, you know, where and another. Um, in general, consider that, uh, you know, consider just uh, how, in, in the following centuries, the general impoverishment and the material poverty, in general, of, of, of this world could be, and, like, so imagine even just the competition of putting somebody's uh, putting your hands on, on, on this stuff in the first place for all the reasons you can imagine. So coming back to the so-called Vandalic Arabias, so properly the Vandalic rage in Rome uh, that was destined to make a mess in the orbs for two weeks. Um, well, let's say that this time this Rome was severely sacked uh, of her riches, right? differently from from the Visigothic sack. But it, it should be, however, pointed out that even in 455, aside from this unheard uh, robberies of, of, of riches and of works of art, um, the, the, um, a great deal of the uh, temples, the great public palaces were, were, were still there. Right, um, the you know the for example the the wall the the Aurelian walls the towers the gates, the buttresses the the bridges the fountains, the imposant public works of Rome didn't actually have 
any damage, any substantial one at least, right? Because um, a very few buildings were completely burned down, and uh, even less uh, were the numbers that were properly completely destroyed, right? And so, at the end of the 14th day of loot, Geyseric and his army left Rome. By the way, bringing with them uh, a, a large amount of prisoners, uh, mostly hostages, right? These were kind of authoritative figures that could, you know, become political pawns in the hands of the Vandals, including the Empress um, Eudoxia and Gaudentius. Gaudentius was the son of the general Atius, um, who had tried to, at some point, to, to make this um, imperial marriage and you know, with the relatives of Valentinian the third, so that Gaudentius could have become emperor, likely, after St. Valentinian, but things went otherwise, as we said. Um, and Eudocia, that was one of Eudoxia's daughters, the name is a bit, you know, tricky, but they are two different women, uh, who also was prisoner of the Vandals, will end up to uh, get married to a son of Geyseric, um, and uh, after this kind of impossible marriage, the the girl will uh, that you know that was opposed to it uh, managed to escape uh, from from Africa, uh, reaching Jerusalem, where, however, you know she had a quite miserable end, and she she would die. Eudoxia, empress that had come out of Rome in chain will type her name to a uh, Roman church that was, ere uh, was erected there and we're talking about St. Peter in chains literally that comes uh, that, uh, that owes its name uh, to this uh, suggestive and oldic legion that is relative to the chains that uh, of, of um, of, of St. Peter, that here, here's the story, because basically Eudoxia got um, from the Patriarch of Jerusalem, according to the Legion, of course, the, the chains that uh, Herod had used to, um, to imprison St. Peter in Jerusalem. And when uh, she, she met with uh, Leo the, 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 the Great in Rome, who had who had brought with him the chains of uh, of Saint Peter that had been used to imprison him in Rome as this uniting these two relics these chains according to to the legend miraculously blended in an indissoluble way because they they of course uh, were witnessing uh, Saint Peter's prison in both Jerusalem and Rome. Um, and, and to remember this miracle, she had the Church of St. Peter in Chains erected. By the way, this is a beautiful place if you go in Rome, because there is also the uh, famous Moses by Michelangelo there. Um, and uh, so every Roman church, in, in a way, in the center is something uh, unusually uh, special in its own. Um, and, uh, and so the story goes mostly from the chains of the... Of the prison of Jerusalem, and the one of the Mamertine uh, prison in Rome, by the way. And uh, this is at least the story uh, that uh, goes by, you know, the Mirabilia Urbis Rome. So, what happened to Rome after 455? Well, you know, having reacquired their own freedom, the Romans will commit uh, in themselves in completing the inventory of, of the ruins and of the wounds that had been inflicted to the city. And however, the Vandals, in spite of their, you know, cruel fame by which they are accompanied, as we were saying before, um, unfairly at least compared basically to, to any other people of the time, they largely spared Rome. Right, it was too, Rome was too big to be destroyed, especially in two weeks with the, the offensive means of the time. It was was not even their point. They were just there for the loot, right? A quick one, a clean thing, right? Without risking too much in the broader operation, just for the loot, 
Right, and um, and also most of the prisoners were actually um, sent back to Rome, so life resumed as before. Um, the damage was enormous, but it seems really excessive to conclude, as some historians said at the time, in two weeks the city would have lost something like 200,000 inhabitants. doesn't make any sense. There is no evidence of this. Rome went on. Um, certainly... Um, the the 455 sack left a more visible trace and uh, also a non completely surpassed when when uh, surpassed one when 17 years later in 472 Rome will um, n know still this new uh, outrageous siege uh, at, at the hands of uh, Ricimer the Swabian Gothic um, Roman general that uh, from 456 to 472 as patrician and by the way under the, uh, the Eastern Roman control um, will detain practically the, the imperial office and that will um, that will be a sort of prede immediate predecessor of Odoacre and um, other fatal Right, un unhappy dates, let's say, uh, impoverished and compromised Rome after the one of 455. But with Geyseric, the uh, tragedy is, is, in a certain sense, partially re restrained, right, contained, and the consequences can be surpassed, right? Um, in fi in the, it's interesting that in 500 AD, um, in, um, in uh, this is still a story by Procopius. The former uh, capital of the empire uh, would have um, found basically his traditional uh, setting once again. In fact, at the moment of the arri arrival of Theodoric, that as soon as he controlled con uh, took control of Italy, um, will fundamentally. Uh, visit Rome and um, and immediately uh, make homage to, to the Pope, by the way. Um, the city appeared splendid and beautiful, right? And uh, thus, a uh, great part of the wounds that had been previously inflicted to her were, were, were erased. And exactly on that occasion, it, the, 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 the Bishop Fulgensis of Ruspe, that was in Rome, where he had come from Sardinia, and uh, he was ready to welcome the Gothic ruler. He wrote to his um, uh, brothers uh, very famous and memorable words. These quote: "How beautiful has it has the paradise to be if Rome, that is only a city and therefore corruptible, is so marvelous and great." And this is beautiful. Because um, you know that Fungensius of Ruspe was born in Vandalic Africa, and at this time he didn't, uh, you know, later on he he went to Egypt to, to to lead a hermetic life. At some point after these events, he would have had actually trouble with the Vandalic king Trasimund because of the clashes between the Catholics and the Arians and so on. But at this point, uh, you know, Fulgensius came straight from, you know from from a context where you know he he would be impressed by Rome of course of even you know having been raised under the the rule of the same who had sacked her um so when we read Fulgentius but also Procopius um and uh, the same episodes about Theodoric uh, Cassiodorus that talk about Rome in, in such terms that in the sixth century, before the Gothic War, were, were were quite eloquent. Well, we can surely know that, despite 455 was a terrible year, um, uh, that that day wasn't the ruin of Rome, right? And that it was, which was not even an irreversible thing uh, by that point. Um, so, of course, we will talk again about this stories these years because lots of things were going on in the meanwhile for now however we stop it here i just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like 
or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.